All right, and welcome to the first episode of Butler's Babble. What is Butler's Babel? Well, we're here. We're going to try and empower you. We're going to try and motivate you, inspire you so that you can have the best lives possible. And to do that, we're going to bring on guests every month that have been through something in their life that's somehow got them depressed or they've gotten down in their luck somehow, whether it be financially, it could have been uh, emotionally, mentally. And we're going to see how they got through that and came out on the other side and became successful in something in their life because we all are going through that, especially in the last two years. So tonight's guest, you're really going to love. I've known her for, I think we worked out, it was about, tw- about 25 years now. Uh, we met a while ago back. So I know you're going to enjoy having uh, uh, a listen to what she's got to say. Uh, before we start, I just want to do a little house cleaning. Um, if you've never been on a podcast with StreamYard before, which is the the uh, form that we're using. Um, if you want to leave a comment, by all means, you can leave a comment in the comment section there, or even a question for Carrie. Uh, if you have a question for them, um, leave the question there. Uh, but if you can go to streamyard.com forward slash Facebook and give them permission to use your name, we'll at least see who's actually leaving the comments there and we can bring it up and we can ask Carrie uh, the questions as we go. So I'm not going to sit here babbling on too much, even though it is called the Butler's Babble, and I'm going to bring on our host here. But before I do, let me let you know a little bit about Carrie. Uh, Carrie Lee Brown, she's a mother, she's a a, um, a wife, she's a sister, um, and we met back in the 90s, back when we both worked at a bodybuilding fitness magazine. Uh, she's a very, very, very talented journalist and um, very highly sought on a lot of magazines. Uh, she's written for countless of magazines, and I'll let you talk, let her talk, tell you all about them. Um, but she did have a little issue that happened back at uh, when she was around 39, and we're going to get into that. But uh, let's bring Carrie on, and this is Carrie Lee Brown. So let's bring her in um, if we can. <laughs> Add the stream. There we go. Hi. There she is. Hey, John. Welcome to the show, Carrie. Thank you so much for having me. This is so exciting. Your first episode. I'm on. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> and I knew as soon as I, I've been planning this for a long time. And I knew I've been telling my wife the whole time and a lot of friends, as soon as I get this going, the logistics going, Carrie's my first guest because I knew you had a good story to tell. And we've known each other. I can't believe it's been almost 25 years. It has. It has. It doesn't feel like it. It feels like yesterday, right? (laughs) It does. It does. But it's a lot of good memories. And I thought I had them on my computer, but I don't. I was going to show pictures of you and I together, but I don't even have them on here, I don't think. But uh, there was something that you sent me, actually. We'd have to go back to the archives and the little negatives, right? That's (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. Back in the film days. Um, So... um, let me get, uh, let's let's get to know Carrie a little bit. So why don't we let everybody, I know a lot more about you, but they don't know about you. So let's go back to early stages, early Carrie. Tell us a little bit where you're born. Give us a little bit about the childhood of Carrie. Sure, absolutely. Well, hi guys. Thanks for having me on, John. Um, gosh, I'm a Canadian. I am from Toronto. I was born in Toronto. I grew up in Milton, Ontario, in the GTA, just outside of, of the city. Um, most of my, um, career was there as well, which I'll get more into later, but I grew up in Milton and I'm like a small town girl, but I love the city and I was always in awe of the media and, you know, bright lights, big city type of thing. And, uh, oh, I think Sarah Lyons is saying hi. Hi, Sarah. <laughs> I can see. Um, yeah. So, I mean, that's kind of where I'm from. And, um, you know, as a kid, I have one sister. I had my parents, my parents, uh, my mom was from Wales and my dad was from Ireland. And, um, my dad still lives in, in Milton or in Guelph right now in Ontario. And my sister is there in Milton with with my niece. So I kind of grew up in a smaller town, and um, it's bigger now, of course. And worked a lot of my my early days and, and my university around the Toronto area. And for those of you know those people who know, I went to um, Wilfrid Laurier University in Waterloo, and then I also went to Ryerson uh, Polytechnic University, and um, that's down in Toronto. And so I. I basically had a great childhood. I grew up, I was very competitive. I used to be actually a competitive Irish dancer that for those of of you who know me, um, I was in that for 15 years. I went over to the world's three times representing Canada. Um, It was a big part of my my childhood was competitive Irish dance. And of course, my dad being from Dublin, that's where that comes from. Um, I loved, you know, I was played softball and volleyball at school and I was very, very active. And I think that kind of lends to the lifestyle that I've always led and, you know, my kids have today and, 
And, you know, hence the reason why I'm so busy with work. I just, I just can't stop. I just keep going. <laughs> <laughs> I know that about you. You're a very hard worker. But as a child, were you like into sports too and that? Or was it more just dancing? Or were you more of an academic? Um, I say both. Um, dancing was the biggest thing. But no, I did. I was, I was in rep softball for my hometown and we traveled around and um, volleyball at school and, you know, track and field and that type of thing too. But dancing was kind of my main thing. But I've always loved all kinds of dancing, really. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I was always very active and sports were a big part of my life and always being very active. Um, you know, it's just one of those things, right? Once you kind of are into it, you kind of continue it throughout your life. And with Irish dancing, I used to actually teach too. So when I, um, I competed for 15 years and then when I went off to university, I um, ended up quitting. Um, as most people do, they leave their sports, you know, to go do their schooling and I started to teach and I, I taught a lot of um, girls. There's a lot of competitive um, Irish dancers that I used to compete against who started their own dancing schools and I started to teach um, and help them kind of build their schools. And some of them still have their schools today, actually. Uh, one of them, frankly, is in, in Milton. And um, so, yeah, I used to teach. And then actually when I um, started at my first job, I, um, I actually went on to do um, a professional live Irish dance show. Mm -hmm. At, um, at the Royal Alexander Theatre in Toronto in my 20s. And I came back kind of out of retirement and I did that for three months full time and did seven shows a week. And wow. I got a, yeah, and I was working full time too, right? At Muscle exactly. Night. So it was like a big deal, but it was great. And it was fun to come back and, and kind of get back on stage again and get in shape again and also see some of my old, you know, the girls I used to compete against as a, as a kid. So yeah. it kind of followed me right throughout my 20s, really. But at that time, I was able to make some money from it, which was nice. Yeah, I didn't know you did that professionally like that because I remember the Royal Alexander because I remember going to see Phantom of the Opera there. It was there for like 10 years. Yeah. Beautiful well, theater. Yeah. And it fits a lot of people in there. So you must have had a lot of people coming to yeah. watch it. It was called River or, uh, Need Fire. Need Fire was the one I was in. It was like a river dance for those who okay. know. And it was on for three months. So, yeah, I'm very proud of it. It's a big part of my background. Awesome. And through school, were you always the type that was like a bookworm or were you always writing or was yeah. that something that came on later in life? Oh, I would say it was, I've always been a writer. I'd probably be more of a writer than a reader, which is okay. funny because most mm -hmm. people would think, well, you probably read a lot of books if you write books. But I must admit, I think I was more of a writer, more of a journaler. Um, I would write down everything, you know, lists, lists, lists. And there's a lot of people that have to-do lists, but I would, you know, cross up the to-do list and make it a, you know, another list and keep going on. I have, I still have a lot of my journals from when I was a childhood. That's what's interesting. I have all my old diaries that I actually used to have like a lock on them and I've lost the key, but I can open them and I actually still have them. I should make a book out of them one day. It would be kind of funny, but that yeah, I think back fun. then, I mean, obviously when every, you know, before you know, social media and the internet and that, I used to just write and I kept all of them. And I just kind of, it was my outlet, right? Even as a child, um, I can't remember how young I was when I started journaling, but it's always been a big part of my life. And um, mm. I enjoy writing for sure. Definitely. And was it more just about life stuff or did you ever get into more fiction type stuff and just have some fun or? Um... Sometimes, I mean, I guess, yeah, I used to make up characters like all kids do and kind of, you know, maybe, I, you know, fictitious characters of maybe it was me in the future type thing. And I always had these dreams of, you know, moving to New York and running a magazine. And, you know, that's kind of, I followed that. But um, I always had these really, really cool things to aspire to. And I used to, you know, write, write them all down and kind of like, it was funny because when you look back, right, there's a lot of things that you look at and you think, wow, like I actually was probably, you know, um, manifesting some of that stuff at age five or six or 10, mm -hmm. but you don't really realize it at the time. Um, and so that's really interesting. But yeah, I think I was probably always a writer. It was always in my heart anyway. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so you go through high school and do you have an idea at that time what you want to be or what you want to do? Did you know that writing had something to do with it or were you still just one of those ones like my daughter was where grade 12, she still didn't know what she wanted to do with her life. Yeah. Well, I didn't know that I wanted to go into media just yet. Okay. I don't even know if I really understood what media was. I mean, obviously the, there was the news on TV, but I didn't realize there was, you know, magazine or print journalists. Um, not really at that time, but I always loved writing. I used to, you know, I got the English award in grade eight. I mean, I was always a writer <laughs> in some way. I didn't mind writing essays. I know there's people that hate that, but I wasn't so much the math person. It was just mm -hmm. not really me. And I preferred writing. 
the research side of things and just kind of putting your your thoughts on paper and mm -hmm. um, or poems too. I like poems and I, I wrote, I've written quite a few poems as well. So, but graduating from high school, um, when I went to Wilfrid Laurier, I, I actually went there in political science, funny enough. So that's my okay. undergrad is actually political science and my uh, minors in communication studies. And at first I thought maybe I'd want to go into law or something like that, or writing about law or, or reporting in the newsroom or in the, um, the courtroom. I wasn't really familiar with all of the media jobs. And I think that was what kind of came to me during university time was because I was exposed to media studies classes. Okay. And then I took a few of those in my communications undergrad and I learned that you can actually get jobs writing for the media and writing magazines and, you know, really helping people through, through the written word in some form. And I also learned that it didn't all have to be so serious, hardcore hitting news either, right? It could just be stuff that we wanted to read for our leisure or that we wanted to read to learn something and to be coached or educated. So yeah. that kind of exposed me to that. And then that's how eventually I graduated from Wilfrid Laurier. And then I went on to Ryerson in Toronto, which is where I, um, I basically did a, a graduate program there in journalism and I had to apply and I I got accepted I can't remember how many applied but I know there was only 150 that got in and out of thousands and I had to do this whole big thing right um, I actually had to write a story about me in third person and that was part of the portfolio you had to do and it was kind of fun to do that and explore that and then I went to there and in at Ryerson at the time, I'm not sure how the program is now, but you could either major in broadcast journalism, print journalism, or in magazine. And I chose magazine. I think I've always liked the glossy side of magazines. But, you know, it's just different than a newspaper. I, I just think it was pretty and I love to have the glossy magazines in my hands. So I went that route. And that's yep. what I did for two more years. And so altogether, I did six years of school and you know, it led me to basically my first, my first job. So. And then luckily that was first job was somewhere that I was, because that's how we got to meet, of course. That's how we met. Because yeah. I had been working there since 1992. And then I think it was 98, you said you started yeah. working yeah. for Mark and Mike. Yeah. So I graduated in 1998 from journalism school. I was an official you know, professional journalist. And I was, I was actually already doing some part-time work actually at the time um, okay. for a magazine called Hot Toronto Magazine and Ooh. and even Wow Mississauga Magazine. Isn't that funny? That goes way back in my, that was my first kind of boss before Bob. Um, Joey C was his name. He's still around today. Um, and anyway, he, he got me a little bit into the entertainment industry. So I used to go and cover a lot of the really cool things that were happening around Toronto at the time. And that, okay. exposed, yeah, I did that actually part time. And I was also an entertainment reporter on CFRB radio. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. And a couple of other um, spots like that. Um, and I did something called the sizzle sheet, which was at the time, it's really dating me now, but we used to <laughs> fax, fax, this is before newsletters. We used to fax a sizzle sheet by Carrie. Um, out to all of these kind of subscribers. It was really funny when you really think about it, but they were faxed out to people. So I did that part-time during school. And then of course I landed my job at, at Muscle Mag and I was thrilled. I was just thrilled to basically get into a magazine. I mean, at the end of the day, when you're coming out of school, you just want to get into the profession that you've being trained for Definitely. and originally I thought I'd maybe go into fashion or into beauty journalism. Um, but the fitness magazines came to me and I was like, well, I'm, I really want to start on this, this, you know, this guy who interviewed me, Bob Kennedy was just so welcoming at the time. And he wanted to give me a chance as he does a lot of people and he hired me. So I was hired on as assistant editor of muscle mag and muscle mag, of course, is a bodybuilding magazine. And, uh, it was at the time, it was one of the biggest ones, of course, in the market. And I knew that I didn't know anything about bodybuilding though, which was the, the crazy part. Um, but you know what? There he is. That's Bob and I, Robert Kennedy, and he's passed away now. But um, mm -hmm. I worked for, for him for almost, what, nine years or something like that. And he, yeah. he really gave me my start in the industry for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, definitely. He gave me my, I didn't know anything about the bodybuilding industry at no. all. And uh, I actually answered an ad on the board in Brampton there. I was uh, looking for a job and I answered yeah. an ad and it was for a, a driving job for a company. I didn't even say the company. And I went and it was Bob Kennedy that was looking huh. uh, for somebody. And I did my interview and uh, he actually hired me 
and it was on the August long weekend. He didn't realize that that Monday was a holiday and they actually told me, okay, can you start Monday? I said, yeah, I'll be there. Of course I show up and nobody's there. Nobody's there. <laughs> he probably did that on purpose to test you. That's what he did. I'm Could sure. have been. Cause then uh, of course, Trudy, who used to work there in that, she showed up to get some extra paper. She's like, did he tell you to start today? I'm like, yeah. She goes, no, you don't start till tomorrow. That's so right. I ended up going home and then starting the next day, but they ended up paying me for that day. So that's oh, how, there you go. that's yeah. what muscle mag was like. So. Yeah. And it's crazy because of course with muscle mag being bodybuilding and very kind of niche market and I had huge, huge, um, obviously readership, um, mostly male, obviously at the time. And, you know, me thrown into that, I didn't know anything about it, but of course he gave me all this great responsibility, even as, as assistant editor to do all these star profiles. So, you know, one of my first star profiles for muscle mag was Frank Seppi and okay. yeah, yeah. He's a huge name back then and still is now in the industry. And, you know, he was really, um, <laughs> he was really somebody who I, you know, I thought was great. And I, I flew to New York to interview him. And uh, I just think it was wonderful because Bob really gave me my opportunity. And mm -hmm. he, he he knew how green I was, you know, like, yeah. you know what I mean by green? I didn't know anything about the industry. And he just threw me in and he was like, go for it, do it. And so, um, yeah, I interviewed him and I, you know, Victor Martinez and Ronnie Coleman and all these big names. And, you know, some of them were just starting out. Some of them were mm -hmm. already pros, but it really gave me my kind of tenacity in journalism. And I think that's mm -hmm. one of the biggest things I can kind of give to Bob now is that I've moved on from obviously bodybuilding and, and everything. But um, I think that, you know, some of the situations that he put me in, in regards to interviewing mm -hmm people who I didn't know anything about, it really made me a stronger interviewer. And it really and, made And you me, were assistant editor at that time, correct? I was only assistant editor. Now there wasn't yeah. a huge masthead, you know, a lot of people, but mm. you know, we had our roles and he still gave me a lot of, yeah. a lot of, you know, things like that to do. And I interviewed- it was that type of personality. Cause that's mm -hmm. how I got, he's the one who got you in your first job. That's how I began photography was through Bob. Yeah. Cause I wasn't going to be a photographer yeah. at that time. I knew nothing about photography, but he was a photographer himself and, a, and an right. artist. Right. And, um, and he's the one who I would do bodybuilding shows or something. He'd say, Oh, you need a, sh here you go. He'd give me his like $3,000 lens and say, here, you can use this. Yeah. Like that was yeah. just the type of guy he was. Yeah. And I think everybody who, honestly, everybody who kind of worked at muscle mag and arcade publishing, you know, throughout the years and, you know, I left and there was, you know, several that stayed on for longer and stuff. And I think that everyone just has that feeling of, you know, Bob was that guy who just gave us a chance and mm -hmm. a lot of us a chance and he just really trusted us. So it was wonderful. And I think, um, I mean, he came to my wedding in Bahamas, yep. um, you know, like we really, we were a family there. I mean, I must admit we really were. And so, you know, I interviewed all these big guys and that, and, and he really let me kind of start to shine. And, and I think, um, and then also then, you know, he wanted to start, um, this is how I kind of moved into the next publication there. So he wanted to start a men's kind of more mainstream fitness magazine, which was, you know, something that, you know, I thought, wow, what an opportunity to start a magazine with Bob. And so he did, he made me the founding editor and editor in chief of American health and fitness. And there it is. And there that's Montel Williams. And I interviewed him back then in the day. And I, actually, I was even a guest on the Montel Williams show for that too. And I was, I judged a, a weight loss contest on the mm -hmm. show. So that was kind of cool. Um, but yeah, he gave me this opportunity to start this, you know, celebrity kind of men's fitness magazine, the first sure. of its kind. And he allowed me to do that. So I did that for five years. So I was still under. And wasn't it called at first AHF or did they shorten to that later? Yeah, it was, it was at first, but, um, well, AHF actually came afterwards because okay. once the name got like, you know, you became, it became a, the acronym, but, mm -hmm. um, AHF was exactly how we kind of ended it. And, um, and then, I guess and it was then, his kind of answer to, um, um, what was it, um, the one that we had, men's health and men's yeah, fitness. Yeah, yeah. And then ultimately this one became Maximum Fitness, right? And that was after I left. Okay. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was it was a really great experience. We shot a lot of and interviewed a lot of celebrities at the time and um, fit celebrities like in, in Hollywood. And uh, so we flew to California and did a lot of our shoots with all the big name photographers. And, you know, it was a really big, another building block of my career to mm -hmm. be able to, you know, start that magazine under Bob Kennedy, you know, and then it was five years later. I mean, we're talking, yeah, like five, six, seven years, almost, well, no, maybe not, maybe, yeah, about six years into my career there. And, and he approached me about becoming the editor in chief of oxygen. And so it was still under his umbrella company. 
Mm -hmm. um, and that there actually was my very first oxygen um, issue that I was editor in chief of. I was really okay. excited. And, um, you know, it, it's just, I don't know, it just, you know, it's kind of one of those things where it's very nostalgic for me. Mm -hmm. um, and what's ironic is that gal right there who I'm still friends with on Facebook, Devada, she actually was on my very first cover of Oxygen. And guess what? She was on my very last Oxygen of cover. Or oxygen. Oh, there you go. So how crazy is that? And I should have exactly. been. I'll have to send it to you after this, John, because she was on the last one that I left with as well. Well, I don't know if you remember it, but um, there was one time when I was up for a cover of Oxygen, one of my pictures that I shot. And yeah. it was of a, a shot I did in um, California of a, a young lady named Brandy Hale. And oh, yeah. you had picked it and you wanted yeah. to use it. And it was up against, uh, and I, I told the story to Monica once, because uh, mm -hmm. it was up against a picture of Monica Brandt. And uh, you had it down to the two of them and you gave yeah. them to Bob and said, okay, yeah. which one do you want? And you didn't tell them who the photographers were or anything like that. No. And I don't think it was till about a year or two later, I talked, told him the story that he found out that the one he didn't pick was my shot. Oh. And that's the one with the Monica Brandt shot. I think it was an Alex Ardanti shot where she had the roller blades over her shoulder. Oh yeah. And that's yeah, the one yeah. that beat up my, my, that was my one chance to get an oxygen cover and, and it beat that. But I came in the top two, so. There you go. And that's a great story. Yeah. So oxygen was my kind of next big, well, it was a big thing. And it was big also because it, it then brought me and introduced me to the female fitness world. Mm -hmm. So the two mag magazines prior were male or um, more dominated. And uh, the audience that I was writing for was men mostly. So mm -hmm. I had to shift gears and then obviously became the editor in chief of oxygen, which again is kind of one of my claims to fame, if you will. It's one of those things I really talk about when I'm interviewed and um, you know, it was a really big part of my career as well. So it was another big building block. And I have to thank basically Bob for that too. No, that's awesome. And yeah. it's funny because I was looking while you were talking and if people are wondering why my eyes are wandering, I got my, I got you guys down here on the production. So I'm watching Carrie over here. I've got another screen going here with all those graphics and everything going on. And I got things going on down here, but I came across this that I just, before we go move on, I, I had to show it, of course, okay. because we did talk about it a little bit. Actually, that's not the one I wanted to do. <laughs> we'll do, uh, I think this one will be a little bit better and we'll see if I can find it there. There we go. Oh my goodness. Yeah. And so there's one there. That was at, I believe the Arnold classic. I think it was. And I Columbus think you're so AHF. Well. I don't know if you were with Muscle Mag or AHF at the time, because there's Pam who was with Oxygen at one time. Yeah. So I was her. Yeah. I was after that. So there I am. Oh my goodness. It's right a long there. Time. There you are right there. Yeah. And there's me in the background with my yeah. camera. You can't see the camera. Crazy. I actually had hair a little bit back there. Crazy. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's the old, old crew, right? Like that yes, was that's really bad. The old yeah. crew. That was probably around, I'm guessing, late 90s, early 2000s. Yeah. You know what? One day on this show, you're gonna or this, uh, you're gonna have to do like you know, get a few of us on and do like one of those square things, almost like the Family Feud thing. And we're I think that would be very cool. Really very cool. Well, who knows? Maybe one day we'll be able to do this show in person. We'll fly everybody in yeah. and we'll just do it in person. That would be great. So, but now moving on. Now you're in the Muscle Mag. You go into mm -hmm. American Health and Fitness. You're doing awesome. Then you become the editor in chief of Oxygen Magazine. Yeah. And then um, after Oxygen. You end up leaving um, RK Productions for a while and yeah. you go into another magazine out of the Toronto area. Yeah, well, actually, um, I did. I left um, to get some event kind of a media relations experience. So I actually left and I went to a company called Fame Media and I helped them with their athlete relations. That's and right. Events, I remember that right? now. Yeah. And I was there for a little bit. It was a contract. And then from there, I actually went into the corporate world to basically hone my communications background. And mm -hmm. I kind of, I became vice president of communications at uh, Stop Pilates. So for anybody who's into yoga and Pilates and kind of knowing that it, we, it was a, they manufactured equipment, Pilates equipment, but they also did all the education for all the instructors worldwide. So I became a corporate gal, but I still had my kind of my hand in the health and wellness industry from that aspect. And I got a lot of great experience on the marketing and communication side and went to Germany for some trade shows and it was great. So, but then I also, then I missed magazine world. And so I went back to publications and publishing and I ended up working at Rogers Media, which is a huge, you know, obviously the big um, uh, publishing house in all of Canada and owns a ton of different things right now. And mm -hmm. so, um, yeah, and I worked for Today's Parent, so I became the executive editor at Today's Parent magazine, which was... That was one that surprised me, going from bodybuilding and fitness and 
Well, and then you go to children. <laughs> well, hey, I had kids. I had young kids, all right, then. So it kind of suited me. It was kind of the right time to do that. And I wanted to get my um, experience at a large publishing house in Canada. Mm -hmm. And I did. And so worked down there at one Mount Pleasant in the big Rogers building headquarters and spent a year there. And it was great. I did a lot of, um, gosh, covering a lot of things oriented towards parents, towards moms. And also I did, uh, I actually spearheaded a big um, cross country um, family fitness challenge. So I okay. actually did bring in a bit of fitness and wellness into that um, at the time. And we did a whole big thing where all these families got involved and it was sponsored by Kellogg's. It was a huge thing. So that was part of that. And then, um, but I mean, during all that time, I mean, it was a very stressful time. I was commuting into the city and that was kind of one of the biggest things that, you know, when I look back now on, on the stressors of my life, I was living in Milton um, and I was commuting in on the GO train an hour and then I was taking I, I, the subway up another half an hour. So door to door, we were looking at probably two hours each way a day mm. and it was huge. I mean, it was people go, wow, how could you even do that? And I would never fathom doing that today, but at the time, all the media jobs and the good ones were in Toronto and the city and I lived in the country and, and it's just what people did. And yep. to be honest, in big, big uh, cities and communities that you, the commute is kind of a normal thing. So mm -hmm. that added on to my stress. And, and I must admit being in the public eye for so many years. And when I moved to Rogers, there was a lot of um, public kind of, um, appearances in that because it was Toronto centric and I was on the six o'clock news, breakfast television, all those type of things quite often. And I love that. I used to get mm -hmm. my broadcast fix there and talk about the magazine and what stories we were doing for different, um, special times of the year. So, but it all added up. I mean, it really did. It's kind of just part of my story of how I ended up writing my book. Yeah. So, and which brings us to, I guess, to that part where uh, I guess it was somewhere around that time or not too far from that time where that's when things started coming to a standstill a bit for you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, it was like, you know, any, I mean, all people do, but I mean, moms and busy moms and career moms, we kind of try to do it all. And I wasn't really taking care of my health. And I guess when I say that, I felt like I was but I wasn't really concentrating on my lifestyle and my mm. lifestyle habits. And I think that's a big thing that we all have to think about. And again, in hindsight, I should have better knowing that a lot of my background was in the fitness and, the, you know, the health and wellness kind of industry. So I didn't. And so I was commuting back and forth. I had young ones at the time, two boys, and I was just, I don't know, going, going, going. And it all caught up to me. I mean, at the end of the day, I, um, you know, I started seeing some signs and symptoms of certain things, but I just thought I was run down. Yeah. And at the end of the day, at age 39, I had a heart attack. And I, and that's, it. you know, it, it literally knocked me off my feet. And, mm -hmm. you know, I tell people today, and I speak a lot about it on, on, the, on the topic, about looking after your heart health and, you know, making yourself a priority and learning to slow down. Because at the time, I was a living walking, ticking time bomb. And mm -hmm. I didn't know though, until something happens. So I think just from my own experience, I wanted to really share that. So when all of that happened and I learned that I had been, I actually was born with a, continual, uh, a heart condition that I didn't know about. I found out all of that at age 39 when my body basically broke down. Mm -hmm. And I ended up having cardiac surgery and finding out that I had this heart condition that I had to deal with. And I really just had to take a step back and realize that, you know what, I was overdoing everything. And I had too much pressure on myself at the time that, you know, we do every day. I still do today. But I think now I know when I have to realize how to step back and just really mm -hmm. make myself a priority. So, yeah, it really changed my life, but probably for the better at the end of the day. Definitely. I mean, you're still here and that's what counts. But I remember I was when I was reading your book, because I read this when you first sent it to me. Oh couple of years ago, I guess it was. And uh, I was lucky enough to get a nice signed copy from you, of course. Uh, but I, I, I reread a lot of it this week because I wanted to get more refreshed on it because I knew bits and pieces from what I remembered. But when I remember you talking about the whole incident of you having the heart attack, 
you didn't even believe you were having it. You were just tucking right. your boys into bed. Like, I don't want to give too much of the book because I want people to buy the book, of course. But yeah. you were basically just tucking your kids into bed. And even they saw it in your face yeah. uh, when, when it happened. And when you went downstairs, you even told your husband, like, no, I'm okay. And you even went to bed that night yeah. just thinking, oh, everything's going to be fine. And when yeah. was it until you actually realized, you know what, I better go see the doctor? Well, you know what, I even went to work the next day. So, I mean, obviously, there's a ton of different, you know, levels of heart attacks. And mm -hmm. mine was was a heart attack, but there's certainly way worse ones. Um, so what happened was I felt a real um, urge to go to sleep, to basically lay down and go to sleep. It was this huge urge of exhaustion mm -hmm. that came over me. I felt a pain down my, my right arm. And I know most people would say, well, isn't it your left arm that you're supposed to feel something? I actually felt it on my other side. And that was one of the things that I just couldn't believe. I was like, well, it couldn't be a heart, anything to do with my heart or a stroke because it just doesn't connect with me and in what mm. I knew it was. But I soon learned for women, the signs and symptoms are very different from a man. I mean, you can be having a, a slight heart attack and it could just feel like indigestion or you could, or it could just feel like your jaws hurting or your yep. back. And I mean, how many times do we have back aches all the time? So you would never think it. So I did, I just went to bed and my husband was even like, well, should we call an ambulance? I was like, no, I'll be fine. I'll sleep it off. And it, I went to work the next day. I remember being out of breath, but I still felt like it, it just could not be that. I, I just didn't believe it. And it really wasn't until a few days later, it was my mom actually who convinced me to go see the doctor because I think I had obviously overcome certain things. My bot, my my heart had you know obviously gone into um, uh, kind of reaction mode to my body, um, but I felt like I could get through it, and I did luckily on my own. But it turns out my my issue was an electrical issue. So there's a mm -hmm. lot of different things with the heart, of course. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it was an electrical outlet basically that wasn't working well so they had to go in and do a cardiac ablation and I ended up having that surgery not long after and since then I felt I felt really good but mm -hmm. I did make some lifestyle changes with that and um, you know I went to start I started seeing a naturopath a nutritionist I started looking after myself more and really reevaluating my stress levels and that's why in my book I really talk about not only my experience and how what kind of led up to that but also I have a lot of different exercises in there for, for men and women um, to stop and kind of reflect and to think about their own lives. And that's mm -hmm. really, what's really the whole point about it is, is that I want people to, to look at their own lifestyles yeah. and to make some changes. And it's about, and it's about also us learning how to read our bodies too, because our bodies are always telling us and we don't listen. I know I don't listen a lot. I've got a bit, what do they call the dad bot? I guess they call yeah. it. And I, gotta go, I always tell them it's not a dad bot. I have a father figure. Or I'm a father figure. Oh, there you go. I like That's that. I, I like it. that. But, uh, but no, and then, and then what I find funny now, well, you were saying that even as a child, you would find times where you yeah. were out of breath, things like that, and you would go to the doctor. And if I'm quoting it right here, it said that your doctor told your mom that um, it could be just a slight heart murmur and you, you'll probably grow out of it. So yeah, I wonder right. if that had, it wasn't a heart murmur. It was this all along. and it, it was that all along and it was coming on worse. And obviously as I got older, obviously it was getting worse. And I think that if it hadn't happened the way it did, it could have happened and it could have been completely deadly if I hadn't mm -hmm. have recognized these signs and, to, and done something about them. But yeah, it was funny. I used to have these really bad heart palpitations as a, as a teenager. And I remember work, I used to work in a flower shop, um, just part time. And I remember having them and I could literally see my chest moving like up to 200 beats per minute. Like it was just crazy. And I used to think, well, I'm not stressed. I used to feel like I was running a marathon, like really bad. And when we went to the doctor, my, uh, my physician at the time said it was like, it was either hormones or, you know, or just a little slight heart, heart murmur that she'll grow out of. And we never thought of anything of it. And it just got worse as life went on. And with stress, like I said, it just gets even worse. And it, the palpitations just were, it's severe. And so that's mm -hmm. the cardiac ablation I, I since had has now rectified that because it, it basically, you know, severed or, you know, ablated one of the pathways where the electricity wasn't going correctly to my heart. So I feel way better now, but, um, you know, it just goes to show that you never know how your heart is going to react to um, different stress levels in your life. Uh, so. Luckily, it wasn't as more severe as you yeah. would thought because you you might not have made it through that to that next morning. You could have not woke yeah. up.
So, and I think, like you said, a lot, I find a lot more women these days um, with the, with a lot of the women in business now and the empowerment of women, which I think is amazing. Um, a lot of women are taking on more stuff than they used to in the past. It used to be, of course, back in the seventies and the eighties, the women are at home, the men are out working or when the women were starting to work, like when, during your era there, yes. um, it was still, and to an extent, I guess, male dominating a lot of industries still, but women are taking on more, mm -hmm. um, on top of a family and that, and I think even in yours, you have these points here, like it can happen to anybody, but any woman really, I mean, it says here, uh, a woman who does too much, tries to be everything to everyone, works hard and keep it together, puts pressure on yourself to be successful in the workplace and at home. Cause I do find that unfortunately these days, women do find that they have more pressures than men and it's not fair. It's, it's not the way it should be. Women are breaking out. And I think it's about time too. I think you guys are doing amazing with it. Uh, you, people don't want to disappoint. They don't want to show weakness. Um, don't know how to say no. That was probably your biggest thing too. And you're like me in that way. You don't want to say no to anybody or simply don't want to ask for help. And, yeah. And uh, those are all, so that's how I wrote my book. My book is like an easy read. It's like mm -hmm. a guidebook. It's 130 pages. It's something that was very reflective for me. I talk about my journey, but then I also have all these tips in there in regards to, you know, things that I learned and I noticed in myself of all these things that I am. And these may have been things that contributed to my heart issue and they could potentially help someone else if someone reads them. So, yeah, I mean, believe me, John, I'm, hmm. I still have to remind myself, I go, go, go now. So it's not like I've made a complete 360 where I'm now like, you know, don't do as, um, as much. I actually do just as much, just different things, but I know when to slow down. And I think, you know, recognize that if I'm not feeling great, I have to make a shift. So, um, but yeah, all those points like, like you, you just brought up from my book are very important to me and they've helped some women and, and men along the way. And learning to say no is a huge thing. Like, I think it's just so important. I have a whole chapter in there on that about how you have to really evaluate who you're saying yes to and why. And even if it's your friends or family or spouse or kids and you have to say no, I think it's just important because you want to be the best version of yourself. And if you mm -hmm. don't do that, and here I am saying this again, and it's reminding myself <laughs> to do the same thing because I'm, I'm just as guilty of it. But yeah. again, that's the reason I wrote the book was to also remind myself. So no, it's very true. It's very, know, very true. Yeah, there it is. Yeah. And I so, mm -hmm. going with the book there, you named it again, my heart, myself. So what was the meaning behind that? Yeah. Well, it was my heart and it was about me. I think that women in particular don't, you know, they don't allow themselves to be able to think about themselves and because they feel selfish, you know, they, they feel selfish when they, you know, think about themselves slowing down or saying no to an obligation or something. And um, like I said, I'm my own worst enemy in this. So um, I really am. But yeah, that's what that means. My heart, myself, when I was naming the book, I, I actually self published this and I, um, I wrote it, edited it and, and got it out there. I had a designer just help me with the front cover, but that is me of course. Mm -hmm. um, but I just, I sent out a, couple of titles to my my close like girlfriends and my sister and got them to kind of vote on the title and that was one of the top runners and I think it was just something that resonated with a lot of women so my heart myself and it's you know it's 10 you know there's 10 signs in, in there that you need to slow down mm -hmm. and it's basically a book for women who do too much which is really everyone yeah, <laughs> so, that's very true well, yeah. Very true. And it, it is, it's a, it's a big thing. And, uh, and of course we know why you wrote the book. You want to help you, but it's a lot of times you get something like this where it's something very personal to you and you're afraid to explain, like just put your uh, yourself out there and show your vulnerability to other people. Yeah. What was the reason for writing this? Did you, did you feel like, uh, I shouldn't be throwing this out there or who's going to listen to me? I'm just, I'm just one person. Why would they listen to me? I'm not a doctor. Well, it's really an interesting story because to be honest, I had actually gone out with my story um, before I published the book. And what's really interesting about that is that I was working obviously at Rogers Media and Chatelaine is a huge women's publication in Canada. And the editor of Chatelaine at the time heard about my story because I was working when this all happened. And she was like, you have to, you have to share the story in Chatelaine magazine. And I was scared to death to do that because I think it really, again, to your point, John, it just made me feel like I was not as strong of a person if I was to share this in public. 
Mm -hmm. I felt like, you know, if I shared my health woes or my health issue, that potentially I would be judged or potentially I wouldn't seem as strong as I maybe looked like I was in the media. Right. So I was very, very nervous about that. And I didn't, I did, I said, I wasn't going to, she hounded me and she asked me for about three to four months. And I, she basically said, if you don't share the story, think about how many women you're not going to be helping in the long run. So that editor's name was Lori Jennings and she's now actually a good housekeeping in New York, funny enough, but she was a good friend and she ended up convincing me and I ended up publishing my story first in Chatelaine magazine. So that was kind of my biggest, um, it, it got out there. And as soon mm -hmm. as that happened, the basically the feedback came pouring in of all positive to Chatelaine and to Rogers and today's Karen. And everyone was like, wow, if it can happen to her, it can definitely happen to me kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And it was really from that point, John, that I thought, okay, now I really have to share this on a larger scale because I just knew that it was just worth sharing. And I think it also made me feel good to help other people, but it, then it also, it was kind of like something I'd been holding in. So then it relieved some stress in me. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of why I ended up sharing it. And then I ended up journaling it and, you know, it took me a little while to write it, yep. but it was very therapeutic and I really wanted to get it out there. And actually funny, I help people get their own books out now. That's what I do now for a living as well. So I help other people share their stories, um, no matter what they are, they don't have to be heart related. Um, and because it makes, you know, it makes me feel good to help them, but also it helps them help others. And mm -hmm. I think that's kind of the whole point of, of, of storytelling nowadays too. So very proud of myself, but I'm proud of everyone else who has ever, you know, decided to share their story as well. So. And that brings us of course, to your publishing there and that with your yeah. red lily. So yeah. that's, uh, and I know you answered it already because I know um, um, Kat on here was wondering if you, uh, did you publish it or did you go through a publisher, your book, and you already said that you published it yourself. And I published it myself through, through self-publishing. I have it up on Amazon. I did it in Barnes & Noble and all the different great places. And um, I uh, even had my launch party at Chapters and Milton and stuff. And I kind of, I took the ball and ran with it, but um, I, I, you know, I did it all myself. And it's you did it the right way because I remember Rob Kennedy yeah. or Robert, Robert Kennedy telling me the story about how when he first published Muscle Mag, he forgot to get a distributor. And yes. so all these skids and boxes of magazines, yeah. all these hundreds of boxes ended up at his house. And he said his whole kitchen and living room were just filled with these boxes. And he had to get oh, a distributor yeah. to distribute all his first issue of Muscle Mag. So yeah. luckily you didn't run into that little issue. No. And I think it's, I have a really good, so it's one of the things I do today just to answer cats. You know, I help people do this and I have a lot of means to help that now. And I even ghost write books for people as well. So, I mean, just, we can talk about that more, but um, no, I self-published it. There was a lot of reasons. I'm an editor and a journalist by trade. I didn't really want to hand it over to another editor at a traditional publishing house just to change my whole story around when really I was the one telling it. And it was just a personal mm -hmm. decision. I'm so glad I did though. And I did all my marketing and my promotion and also my media on my own and pitched. I just pitched lots of different media outlets and I got on, I was on the social in Toronto and so many different things and I'm still promoting it today. And I wrote it a few years ago, but it's still relevant today and it's, it's really leading the charge. So hopefully I'll make a difference in someone's life. Exactly. And they can always go, it's, this is redreallylife.com. Yes. Yeah, so that's what would they find if they went on here? Yeah, so if you click, actually, if you click the logo there, you'll go right back to the homepage. But um, redlilylife.com um, is my storytelling platform. It's where I help women and men, but mostly women, share their stories. And they can submit them online on that website. These stories are of, of you know, struggle to strength, pain to purpose. They're, they all have a meaning behind them. They have a positive message behind them. And I help people get their story out there. It's really a stepping stone um, for someone who wants to just share their story and see where it goes. And then a lot of people from this have decided to write a book or do something more with it, maybe start their, their own blog or whatever. But it's given people some confidence, which they may not have had before to share their story. And I just felt as a journalist and also someone who could, you know, have the means to help people share their stories because I've been through it. Um, just a platform for them to, you know, share their voice. So that okay. is one of the big things that I'm very passionate about now. Um, it's my passion project. 
I have my book on there and I have some other plans for the, for the whole site. That's where you submit your, your submissions. And right now I have over 150 different con contributors worldwide on here who have submitted. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah. So it's only been a couple of years old and there's my book. My book comes in digital format as well as the hard copy. And I know Sarah had put the link, I think, to the Amazon.com where you can also buy the book. But I think you told me earlier that they could buy from Amazon and they get it delivered to them, no problem. But if they came here and bought it, you will actually, you can actually personally sign it to them. I will. I will personally sign it for anybody who wants to do it this way um, and like through readilylife.com. And I will send it to you and I will sign it for you. Um, but if you want to do it kind of uh, maybe quicker because you have Amazon Prime or something, you can go through Amazon ca and dot com actually i'm in several countries um in the uk and mexico and everything um on amazon and they will send it directly from there so exactly. yeah. and it's a great book and i will say um i bought it even though you mostly wrote it for women i told you still yeah. because i wanted to support you i said i wanted to buy one so yeah. i paid for my own copy i didn't get it you didn't yeah. give it to me for free i went and i <laughs> bought it you personally signed it to me Thank a nice you. little paragraph there and they're not going to get us of course the same signature of course but uh, yeah. but the one thing i noticed i think i told you this after i first read it was yes it's written in context towards women and more for women but i mean being married and having two daughters myself one's yeah. just in adulthood now she's just getting ready to turn 21 and one's just beginning to become 15 um i think men should be reading this book too because um I learned a lot out of this and just when it comes to my daughters and my wife and signs to look for with them too. Yeah. And I think it's a very good book, not just for women to read. I think the men should be reading this book too, because I think it can be very beneficial for, for men also. So Yeah. And I mean, yeah, exactly. I've, I have had some other men reach out and read and read it and actually who have even contributed to my platform here, redlilylife.com mm -hmm. and shared their stories. And so it's, it's kind of one of those things where it's a great reminder, like you said, and everybody knows a woman in their life, whether it's a mother or a sister or a daughter, like you said, and you know, they can pass along that message, but then they can also take the tips in. And I have brain breaks in there as well, like which are reflection pages. Mm -hmm. You can take those and do them themselves. I mean, you exactly. never know when you might need it, or there might be a tip in here that you can use as well. So yes, it's very good for men too. Absolutely, absolutely. And then I'm just clicking on here, this Red Lily Heart Supplement. What is this yeah. all about? So, yeah, and my husband and I met through the sports nutrition world, and you know Craig, John. So, yeah, and so we met a long time ago, and he was working at Muscle Tech at the time, and I was at Oxygen. That's where I met him because I was yeah. shooting for yeah. Muscle Tech a lot of times. Yeah, and I mean, it's one of those things that it just kind of, you know, meant to be, and we've been together a long time, and so – He's kind of, he's got his own supplement company now. And so when all this happened with my heart and he's had, he had a heart attack too. There's a whole other segment for you, but um, you know, his was massive, but yeah, we might have to get him on the show one day. You should, you actually should. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, we, we decided under the red lily arm here that it was really important not only to obviously read a book and to, I feel like my book really calls to that mental health side too of heart health, right? Because it's getting your mind in a, in a place where you can accept the fact that you need to slow down, make yourself a priority and listen to your body. And then I have this, this supplement here. It's all, all natural, vegan friendly. It's a heart supplement, which is obviously going to help decrease, help with blood pressure and help you basically, or your overall heart health. It's mm -hmm. a wellness vitamin. And so I think it's one of those things that goes hand in hand, right? Like there's the physical side. You have to look after your nutrition, your supplementation, um, all of that type of thing. And then, of course, there's the mental side. And all of this adds up to your overall wellness and looking after not only your heart, but also your health. And I think mm -hmm. and that's why we launched that. That's actually available on Amazon as well. And um, I actually have an Amazon page myself. It's amazon.com slash red lily. I don't know if oh, you've okay. seen that, John, but on there is kind of everything that you can get under my umbrella. And um, yeah, so it's kind of one of those things that it goes hand in hand. I think it's one of those, you know, really good product that kind of really helps you kickstart the day and, um, you know, level out all of your, uh, all your metabolism. And if they go to redlilymedia.com, is it basically uh, the same information, but it just sends you to different different avenues or? Yeah. 
So that's a whole other thing. Red Lily Media is my media company, and it's okay. basically where I extend all of my professional writing and editing services. And you know, I lead out into yeah my store, and also um, I'm going to be launching some courses in the near future, um, some writing courses, and kind of under that umbrella. And that's where you can learn about my book publishing mm -hmm. offerings and my ghostwriting and everything I pretty much do professionally. You can find under RedLilyMedia.com. Very cool. And that's where, yeah. of course, you're going to be helping me hopefully in the future because yeah. we've been talking about me writing a book for a long time, but yeah. just never gotten to it. Now that brings us, I know we only got, we got about 10 minutes ago, but I don't want to, uh, I want to get into what you're doing now because uh, yeah. I mean, on top of Red Lake, I mean, Red Lake is enough I mean, for anybody. I mean, I could see some people saying, okay, I'm doing this. I'm not doing anything else, yeah. but you're of course the go-getter. You're the one that <laughs> uh, the reason why you wrote the book is because you're, you're not satisfied. You want to go further. So now um, you've got like three different magazines on yeah. the go. Yeah. Well, I and mean, of course, bring Sarah in there. Who's on, who's watching us here. I today. know. I'm going to say that. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I guess, again, I'm a creative person. I've been in journalism for 25 years, love the written word. And I mean, anywhere where I can help someone, you know, with their brand or their business and share their message is kind of what I love to do. And so by day, so we moved to the States. I'm actually here in Denver, Colorado. So we never got to that. We, we, we moved here, um, the whole family for business, for adventure, and I'm in Denver, and I'm the executive editor of Denver Life magazine, um, which is a city magazine here in Denver, talking about all the lifestyle and luxury things you can do here in the city. Um, and then I also am the editor-in-chief of Body Skate magazine and Epic Fit magazine. Actually, I have these right here. I don't know if you have pictures of them. And actually, I do have pictures uh, I was going to bring up here for you. Oh, yeah, well, I didn't have today's awesome. parent, but I forgot to bring that up last time. Yeah. But uh, let's see what we got I here. I have body skate right here in my hand. That's one of them there. And then, and this magazine, which is a beautiful glossy magazine, is um, the publisher and the lead photographer of that is a lovely lady called Sarah Lyons Gladman. And I know you're friends with her too. And she's yeah. been in the fitness world for a long time. And she's launched that magazine. And it's a beautiful magazine. And it highlights so many different women and men. Um, who are really proud about their bodies and work out. And um, yeah, there's a bodyscape as well. That's one of them. That's one of the ones that I've, I've overseen with Jennifer on the cover. And um, so she does all the photography and I actually write all the cover stories. And there's another one, Laura Chow. And so what's great about this magazine and how it kind of differs from some of the, obviously the magazines I've worked in the past in fitness is this really gears towards the story behind the model and behind the, you know, the physical um, and the beauty and the, you know, the perseverance in their own stories. And, you know, Sarah is wonderful about taking their image and just making them so beautiful and putting them throughout the magazine on these, you know, epic kind of photo shoots um, in which, funny enough, Monica Brandt also yeah. helps as the posing coach on set as well for those, um, a big name in the industry. And they do these glamorous big shoots. And then I get to obviously interview all the cover models and tell their story. And again, that's where my passion and love for the storytelling side comes in and I'm the editor in chief now and also the editor in chief of Epic Fit magazine, which is- I don't have a cover of that. <laughs> I have it right here. Oh, there you go, right there. Let yeah. me just make you a little bit bigger there. Hold on a second there. Let's bring <laughs> there you go. in there. There you go. That's Epic Fit. That's so this beautiful. One, yeah, this one just launched. It's a special issue of, it's powered basically by Picture Group Photography, which is Sarah's um, uh, business mm -hmm. and her company. And what we do together is we try to basically help people build their brands and build their personas, whether they want to do it for business purposes mm -hmm. or write a book. And we come together and have joined forces in, in a way that we can both do that from our own talents. And so that's what we're doing right now. And so mm -hmm. I do Denver Life and I help Sarah on the side with those. And I do a bunch of other things with some other people in regards to book publishing and it's just kind of it's everything i love to do all rolled into one so yeah, sarah's amazing I, I haven't met her personally yet one day we will meet maybe yep. i'll come and hold like her reflectors or her lights or something for her i'm sure uh, she loves it probably surpassed <laughs> me by now but i i met her for the first time not in person but online through our mutual friend monica brandt yeah and monica started up her program uh the monica brandt show and one yeah. of her guests near the beginning there was 
was Sarah Lyons there. And that's how I got to know who Sarah was and what it was all about. And when they started showing her photography, I mean, the stuff was just amazing. She, she's just blows me away with the, she makes the women look so beautiful and glamorous. And um, I mean, they already are beautiful and glamorous. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. But it's just a matter of, as a photographer, being a star for myself, to me, the way I look at it, it's our job to always take the beauty that they have there and just try and enhance it the best way we can and how to show it off. And she does yeah. an amazing job. And then one thing I love about the magazine is it's not just a, a digital magazine like most no. magazines have gone to. Um, exactly. There's a few of them still out there. Muscle Mag and Oxygen, of course, was reestablished again in California there. And they still have a physical magazine. And so, but a lot of them just went digital now. But she said, no, I'm not doing that. I'm bringing out a physical magazine. And yeah, I love and absolutely. And I mean, if, if anybody's interested in looking at them or buying them or also, of course, in you know finding out about ways that they can shoot with Bodyscape, Go to bodyscapemag.com and Sarah will answer all your questions. And, you know, if, it's just really a great publication that I'm, I'm proud to be a part of. And I think a big part of it, too, is that it's all about empowering the person who's in front of the camera. And, you know, everyone, it doesn't matter what age you are. It doesn't matter, of course, if you've done competitions or not. It really just depends on whether you have the confidence to get out there and tell your story and then also be photographed for how well you're presenting yourself to the world. So mm. I think it's it's amazing. And so I do that as well. And I'm really happy to do that. And we have a lot of really fun things on the go. We're actually doing a huge, um, you know, a photo shoot weekend here in Denver. So if any of my friends are here in Denver, please contact me about it. July 15th to 17th, we're doing a big spectacular photo shoot here. And you can book and, and shoot and get guaranteed publication in, in Bodyscape Magazine or Epic Fit. So we're very excited about that too. And Sarah, I'm telling you, she even has opportunities for people to get on um, Times Square billboards. So please contact her and go to Bodyscape and learn more about that as well. So if you're- I'll have to get her to shoot me then because then there's nothing yeah. like seeing John Butler up on Times of Square. Of course. Well, hey, why not, right? That's a way to clear oh, the yeah. streets, that's for sure. No, 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 <laughs> they're big. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's just such a great opportunity. So I think I just love working with people now who are just really passionate about what they do, just as much as I'm passionate about what I do. And, you know, joining forces any way that we can and just kind of, um, I don't know, like just bringing out the best in everyone. So that's what it's all about. No, definitely, definitely. Yeah. And um I think one of the biggest factors we can get from this, it's a quote from your book. It's actually by, I hope I say it right. Cause if I'm butchering his name, you can, they can come after me, but Soren Kierkegaard. Is that right? Kierkegaard. Yeah. Kierkegaard. Times, but yeah. <laughs> and it says life can only be understood backwards, but it must be lived forwards. And I think the, everything we talked about today, that sort of signifies it all right there. I mean, if we yeah. could always know what was going to happen ahead of time, we can fix it before it happens. Yeah. And I mean, also, I think in part of my healing was that I had to reflect and look back on my life. And that's a lot of that I do have in the book. I think it's a healing kind of um, a technique that you look backwards, you look at where maybe you are too hard on yourself growing up or, or, or stressed out, or maybe it's your background or maybe where you're from, but at least then you can learn from it and then move forward and then leave it in the past and make changes for the better. So that's what that, that's why I included that quote in my book. I just thought it was really important important to me and hopefully people can learn from it that you can move on from anything and you're also not your past so um hopefully that'll help people kind of see through the struggles and get to the other side i agree with you totally yeah. well i'm glad i had you on here like i said when i first started the whole planning of this i had you in mind for this show because there's been um, a lot of the last two years has been hard on everybody yeah and i think a lot of it is with the mental health, we needed to get some positivity in there. And I think a story like yours, it's not just the, what you went through, but it's how you got through it and what you're doing now to show that no matter what happens, no matter how far down we go, there's always a way we can get back up to the top again. Mm -hmm. And I think you're just amazing. I think people can learn a lot from you. I'm happy we've been friends this long and I see us being friends for another 20, 30 years. Absolutely. If, if I'm around by that time. <laughs> yeah, me too, but hopefully. But yeah, thanks so much, John. And we've gone through a lot. And yes, my story is just one of a million of everybody has a story. That's kind of my purpose of helping people bring that out. And I hope that in some way it'll just maybe help and make one person just kind of you know, look, Sarah's saying, let's do it, John. She wants to, she, <laughs> yeah. she wants to photograph you. So, uh, but yeah, I think it's just one of those things that I can give back in some way and hopefully I'll, I'll maybe help change a life. So. 
No, I'm glad. I know you well because I know a lot of my listeners here that were watching. They were loving what you were saying. I know my friend Cat Ward. She had to leave about ten minutes ago. She said on yeah. here, but she was already on the web page and buying your book right there. I think. Oh, so awesome. She's ready awesome. to buy your book. So there, you can change one more life right there. And that's I think what it's all about. Dude. Even if you could just change one person yeah. for the better, that's what it's all about. So that's what it's about uh, exactly. So yeah, if anybody wants me to help them, you know, like get published or you know at least share your story or help you write a book please contact me and I'll be, I'll, I'd love to do it. I would. So that's awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for coming. And uh, mm -hmm. until next time, be watching because we're doing this every the second Tuesday of every month. We're going to have a new person on here and it's people from all different lifestyles. I've got a good next couple shows coming up that we'll be letting you know who's coming on soon, but we've already got two people lined up that I think you're going to learn a lot from. And maybe we'll get Craig on here one day. We'll have yeah. to talk to him because I think he can, he has a good story to say too. Yeah, um, he does. Um, Thank you so much, John. It's been a pleasure. And hi to all of your fans. <laughs> <laughs> and until next time, remember, if anybody asks, say the butler did it.